Well, it's almost Christmas. Now be honest, parents. How many of you have threatened to, to take back Christmas presents? Come on. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> but we're just a few days away from the big day. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Cornelius was governor in Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is called Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let's pray. Father, we thank You once again for Your Son. We thank You for this uh, season as we don't just remember a manger, but Lord, we also remember the cross. Lord, the cross is what purchased our salvation. The cross is what purchased our redemption. Jesus' death and resurrection is what provided us power. It's what released the Holy Spirit. So Lord, today, we thank You for the cross. We thank You for the sacrifice of Your only Son. Your only Son. We bless You today. and We ask for Your anointing on the remainder of our time here together. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. In verse number 10, the angels come and appear to the shepherds. And their announcement is good tidings of great joy. Everybody say great joy. Good tidings of great joy to all people. Say all people. All people. Great joy to all people. If that's the Lord, tell Him I'm busy. <laughs> and then once again, the Bible says that a multitude of heavenly hosts appear and say, Glory to God in the highest. And look at what it says. And on the earth, peace, good will toward men. The announcement from heaven to earth was that peace would be established on the earth, that great joy would be established on the earth, and that that great joy and that peace would be available to all men. And when I read this, I remember the prophecy from the prophet Joel, where God said through the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then, of course, we know that that was reiterated by Peter on the day of Pentecost, when Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. The Gospel is available to all. Peace is available to all. And the great joy that comes through the Kingdom of God is available to everyone. No one is isolated. No one is excluded from this promise of great joy and peace. But what I want to show you this morning over these next couple of moments is that the great joy and the peace doesn't come through what we remember now as the baby in the manger. The great joy and the peace comes through what Jesus purchased for us on the cross. 
It's actually the releasing of the kingdom of God on the earth. Jesus said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is simply the rule and reign of God in your life. Listen, what I want you to understand, we we say these phrases like God is always in control. God is in control. Can I say something? Listen, God is not always in control. You have to give God control. You know, you have a free will. If you want to leave church today and put on a ski mask and go down and rob the gap, God's not going to stop you. He may put some roadblocks in front of you. And by the way, don't do that, okay? <laughs> Those crazy people up at Fair Ridge are robbing the gas stations in Shade Gap. I can see the news headlines. You understand, you, ha- you have a free will. You, God has enabled you to make your own decisions. God is in control when we give Him control. Listen, God rules and reigns in your life when you allow God to rule and reign in your life. When you submit your will to His. When you give over yourself to the Lord. When you surrender your heart and your life to Jesus and the kingdom of God begins to rule and reign in your life, there's a promise of great joy and peace to all men. How do we receive great joy and peace? It's simple. We submit our will. We say, God, I want your kingdom to rule and reign in my life. But the promise is, through Jesus' death on the cross, that it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom of God. That's the rule and reign of God, not only on the earth, but in your life. Giving God every area, every aspect of your life, and allowing your life to be ruled by the kingdom of God. Listen, it's, it's, it's no secret. It, it, this season, this time of year that we're in, we see an increase in, in suicide and an uh, increase in it almost seems like people are just depressed everywhere you go. And it's Christmas, you know. It's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. But people are sad. They're lonely. They're, they're depressed. And it's amazing that at this time of the year, which should be one of the most joyous times of the year, oftentimes we find people in depression and, and in, in, in misery when it's supposed to be a joyful time. And all I can, all, all I can think of is, is just they haven't received what Jesus purchased for them on the cross. They haven't fully received the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. See, a lot of us as believers, we've received Christ as Savior. We understand Him as Savior. But we also need to understand Him as King of a kingdom. And that when Jesus came, He came to set up a kingdom Not only on the earth, but to set up a kingdom in your life. Jesus wants to rule and reign in your life. And through His rule and reign in your life, release the great joy and the peace that comes through His kingdom. The announcement from the angels to the shepherds was, listen, great joy, good tidings. It's good tidings of great joy. What's the good tidings? The good tidings is it's the gospel. What does the gospel mean? What's gospel mean? Good news. This is the pronouncement from the angels. The pronouncement from the angels. They were actually preaching the gospel. It's good news. You don't have to be bound anymore. You don't have to be sick anymore. You don't have to live in poverty anymore. Jesus is coming to loose your chains. He's coming to purchase your salvation. He's coming to purchase your redemption. And He's coming to release His kingdom in Side of you. Jesus said, don't look here or there. The kingdom's not here or there. The kingdom is within you. When you get saved, when you ask Jesus into your life, you're not just asking Jesus to come and live in your heart. You're asking for His kingdom to come and rule and reign in your life. For the kingdom of God to manifest itself in your life and through your life. That wherever you go, not only are you receiving peace through His kingdom, and not only are you living with great joy, but you're able to give that great joy and that peace to whoever you come in contact with. That's the amazing thing about the kingdom of God, is it's transferable. It rests on you, but when you come in contact with other people, you're able to give it away. The kingdom of God and the manifestation of the kingdom of God releasing joy and peace on you and on those around you. 
Jesus' instructions to his disciples was, listen, you guys, when you pray, pray this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done. Not when we get to heaven, but right now. In this day, this age, this hour, the releasing of joy and peace into your life. And listen, if you're not experiencing joy and peace in your life, I've got good news for you. It's available. Great joy and peace. Peace. Living in peace. And great joy through the kingdom of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 9 with me. Isaiah chapter 9. The amazing thing about this portion of Scripture is this was prophesied hundreds of years. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Verse 6. Isaiah writes, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Everybody say Prince of Peace. Peace. And then look at what He says in verse 7. Of the increase, the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over His kingdom, to order it and establish it. When Jesus came from heaven to earth, He came as the Prince of Heaven. He came as the Son of God. He came as God in the flesh. God walked the earth in the form of Jesus, His Son. It was God in the flesh. But when Jesus came from heaven to earth, He literally came to bring everything that was in heaven down to the earth and make it available once and for all for you and I. That you and I could partake of the things of heaven through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Listen, everywhere that Jesus went for three and a half years, what was He doing? He was manifesting the kingdom of God. When Jesus, at His inauguration, if you will, after He was baptized by John in the Jordan, He went to His home city and He stood in the synagogue and the Bible says He read from the scroll and He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon Me because because He has anointed Me to preach the good news. What's the good news? Listen, the good news is that you and I have available to us everything that's available in heaven. Is there any sickness in heaven? No. Is there any disease in heaven? Absolutely not. Is there any depression in heaven? Of course not. Heaven is full of peace. Heaven is full of great joy. Heaven is full of wholeness. Heaven is full of everything that's good that we can imagine. And when Jesus came from heaven to earth, He brought all of that with Him. And so for three and a half years in the ministry of Jesus, all we see Him doing is healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, setting free those who were demon-possessed and bound by the enemy. All Jesus did for three and a half years was release the kingdom of God on the earth. And then listen what He said to His disciples. He said to His disciples, greater things than these will you do. Because I'm going back. I'm going back. But I've already released this to you. And because I've released it to you, you're going to do even greater things than I did when I was here. John the Apostle wrote in the Gospel of John that if all of the things that Jesus ever did could be written down, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain all of the things that Jesus did. And you understand that when John wrote that, he was referring to the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry on the earth. Think about that. I mean, I've been in ministry for maybe 14, 15 years, 
and I don't even know if I have a chapter yet. You know, Jesus had books upon books upon books upon books. John said, "Not even enough. There's not enough books in the world to contain all the things that Jesus did." And that was only in the period of three and a half years. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, "Greater things will you do than even what I did." The challenge to you and I as a believer is to continue of the increase, the increase of His government. There will be no end. There will be no end. The, what you and I are called to do is to continue to increase His government. To continue to expand His kingdom over the earth. To continue to release the goodness of God into individuals' lives. To continue to release the great joy that's available to us through the cross to continue to release the peace of God in the earth. We have a big challenge, but we have a big God. We have a big opportunity, but we have a big Holy Spirit. One of the greatest gifts that God gave us wasn't just His Son. One of the greatest gifts that God gave us was His Holy Spirit. The Bible says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more does God know how to give the Holy Spirit to those who love Him? One of the greatest gifts is the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, the infilling of God inside of you. And when you have God on the inside of you, He comes out. Whatever's on the inside comes out. You know that? You can't hide it. You can't conceal it. It doesn't matter what you do. It's going to come out. Many of you have complimented Krista. She she loves to decorate. She just loves to make things beautiful. And it's because she's beautiful on the inside. It just comes out. It's natural. Whatever is on the inside comes out. And when you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, make no mistake about it, He wants to come out. He wants to continue to do what He started with Jesus and expand God's kingdom over the earth. Expand the increase of His government, continuing to release joy and peace into the earth. Let me show you an example of this from the book of Acts in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. It says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the Word. What's the Word? It's the good news of the Gospel. Preaching the good news. Preaching the Word. And in verse 5 it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And look at what it says in verse 8. And there was... Great joy in that city. Why was there great joy? The answer is simple. Because the kingdom of God was being manifested to people who needed the kingdom of God to be manifested to them. When Jesus came, we were bound by sin. The Bible says that the the enemy had us wrapped up. Jesus was manifested for this reason, that He might destroy the works of the enemy, the Bible says. When we came, Jesus found man in a broken state. He found us as sinners. I was just at a little concert the other day in Huntington at another church. And the the preacher got up at the end and he said, You know, I'm so thankful that Jesus came because we're all just a bunch of worthless sinners. And I thought to myself, You may think you're a worthless sinner, but my Bible says that I have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not a worthless sinner anymore. I was at one time. But when God looks at me now, He sees me as a son. 
When God looks at you through the blood of Jesus, He sees you as a righteous and holy son or daughter of God. He doesn't see you as a worthless sinner. In fact, I don't think God ever saw us as worthless sinners because God never saw us as worthless. Why would you spend the most valuable possession of heaven on something that's worthless? Come on, you don't spend a million dollars on a home, on a house that's only maybe worth a hundred thousand, do you? That would be ridiculous. So when, when God sent His Son to pay our price, He was giving us the most valuable possession that He has because He saw the value in you and I. He saw the value in humanity. He saw what the enemy was doing to us and He looked down from heaven to earth and said, you were not created for that and you are much more valuable than you even know. So He took the greatest thing that He had and He gave it to us to pay the price. We are not worthless sinners. We are sons and daughters of a great God. And see, all Philip did, he went to Samaria and he found people who didn't have joy He found people who didn't have peace. He found people who were sick. He found people who were living in bondage. And what did He do? He released the kingdom of God to them. And because of that, the Bible says, there was great joy in the whole city. The entire city experienced the kingdom of God. The manifestation of the kingdom of God. A couple years ago, I went to a outdoor concert. It was in Frostburg, Maryland, which Margaret knows where that is. <clears throat> and it wasn't a Christian thing. It wasn't Christian at all, as a matter of fact. There was lots of alcohol, lots of loud music, and a lot of sinners. And I went there for one purpose, and that was to set up a table and offer to pray for people. And that's what we did. So we went, there was probably about five or 600 people there. It was a pretty big event. And we went, we had our little booth. I had two people from my church with me. And we sat there and nobody was coming. And uh, there was people all over and nobody was coming to our booth. We had some free water. We were giving away free water. And we had some signs up that said, we want to pray for you. Jesus heals. And here we are in the middle of darkness, light in the darkness. And, and the organizer of the whole event came over to our booth. I had had special permission from him to do this thing and told him we were going to pass out water and just pray for people and he was good with that. So he comes over to our booth and while he's walking to our booth, I notice that he's walking with a pronounced limp. He hurt his knee. So he comes into our booth and I say, hey, what's going on? I noticed you're limping. He said, yeah, I've been setting up all this equipment today and I just, my knee can't take it anymore and it just hurts. And so I said, well, listen, sit down right here for a minute. And let us pray for you and let's just see what happens. So he sat down, we prayed for him. And long story short, after praying for him for a couple times, his knee was completely restored, no pain, and he didn't have a limp anymore. That's good, amen? But the amazing thing was, after he got healed, he looked at me and he said, listen, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, we've got about 15 minutes of free time on the stage why don't you and your group take it? We're in front of five or 600 people. You know, it's a big group. Why don't you guys take the 15 minutes? And I had no idea what I was going to do at the moment, but I said, I'll take the 15 minutes. So we had about three or four hours before four o'clock came around, and so we're just praying, Lord, what do you want us to do? What are we going to do? 15 minutes in front of five or 600 people who are pretty much at this time pretty well intoxicated and enjoying their fun. What do you want us to do? And so the thought came to me, well, you came here to see people healed. You came here to preach the gospel. So you've got 15 minutes in front of a captive audience. So why not do that? And I remembered the story from the Old Testament from Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? When he gathered all the prophets of Baal together and he was, he called, the challenge was to call down fire from heaven. You remember that story? So I said, well, that's what we'll do. So I got up on the stage at 4 o'clock, five, 600 people out in front of me, and I said, listen, we're here, we've got a booth over here, we're just loving on people, praying for people who are in pain, 
and giving away free water. And right now, in front of everyone, we're going to do a public healing. There's five or 600 people there. If God doesn't show up, <laughs> I'm going to look pretty foolish. But sometimes you've got to put yourself out on the limb. That's where faith takes over. So I scanned, the, I scanned the audience and we saw this one guy walking across the field and he was limping really bad. And I tried to get him to come up on the stage, but he just wouldn't come. So I called out to the crowd. I said, is there anybody here that's got a back problem? Anybody in severe pain? You've got back problems and it hurts you real bad. And way back in the back over here, there was a young guy. That his, he wasn't raising his hands, but his three drunk friends were pointing to him saying, this guy right here. So I'd say, come on up. So in front of five or six hundred people, I called him and his four intoxicated friends and we're right up here on the stage. And I start telling them about Jesus and how Jesus wants to heal him. Listen, the guy's drunk. Are you with me? But I'm pretty sure that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And he doesn't care what condition they're in. He'll still touch them. And so right there in front of five or six hundred people, we grew out his leg, which you guys, some of you have seen that happen here. His four drunk friends are looking at it like, what in the world is that? And he gets up. How's your back feel? It feels fine. Feels good. So he walks off the stage. I preach the gospel for just a minute, talk about healing, and I invite them to come over to our booth. And then we walk off the stage. But the amazing thing that happened that day was that while we were walking off the stage, we saw the man who had walked across the field earlier with a really bad limp. I mean, he was walking really bad. And so we're, we're, we're off the stage now. We're away from the crowd of people. And here comes the same guy walking across. And I just stopped him. I said, hey, listen, I know you didn't want to come up on the stage a little earlier, and I can understand that. There's a lot of people here. But I really want to pray for you. What's going on with, with your leg? And he said, well, it's not my leg. It's my foot. And he began to describe to me a condition. It's, I think it's called drop foot or something like that. Something with the tendons in the foot that when you pick up your foot, your foot just falls. Your foot doesn't stay up like it should. And so it causes him to drag his leg and to limp. And I said, how long have you had that? He, years. For years he's had that. And he even said this to me. I asked him if I could pray for him. He said, well, listen, the doctors couldn't fix it. So what makes you think you can that's a good challenge. And the fact is, and I told him, I said, well, I can't change it at all, but I do know someone who can. And I just said, will you let me pray for you, please? And I'm telling you, this is the, this is the absolute truth. We knelt down, prayed for his leg just one time, one time, prayed for his foot. And I said, now you walk and see if it's any different. And he walked as normally as I do. Walked as normally as you do. And if you could have seen the expression on his face, priceless, priceless. And the reason I tell you that story is because this is the exact same thing that Philip experienced when he was in Samaria. Listen, Philip did not go to Samaria to preach to Christians. Are you with me? There was no church there. They were sinners. They were bound in their sin, doing the same things that we saw at that day in Frostburg, Maryland. But when, Pete, when Philip came, he preached the kingdom to them. And when the kingdom of God came, it changed everything about them. He saw the sick healed. He saw the demon possessed set free. He saw those who were bound by the enemy set free. Their chains loosed. And because of the manifestation of the kingdom of God, there was great joy in that city. That's what the kingdom of God does. Listen, it's not a Christmas story. It's the kingdom of God. It's not a Christmas story. It's what Jesus did at the cross. It's not a Christmas story. It was God's plan of salvation and redemption. And it's available to you. It's available to me. And it's available to everyone who's around us. My greatest, joy, my greatest hope is that God's kingdom would be manifested right here. That God's kingdom would not be manifested in this building, but God's kingdom would be manifested all around us. That you and I as believers would understand what is available to us because of Jesus. What is available to us because of what Jesus brought from heaven to earth. And begin to touch humanity with the kingdom of God. 
That's a Christmas message. The greatest gift wasn't just Jesus in a manger. The greatest gift was Jesus on the cross. But God didn't even stop there. Because God's a giver. And even after He gave His own Son, He didn't stop there. Then He gave us the Holy Spirit. When He gave us the Holy Spirit, He gave us His kingdom. The Apostle Paul wrote, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it's available to you. Healing is available to you. Deliverance is available to you. Peace is available to you. And the great joy, not just any type of joy, but great joy is available to you. How do you receive it? Well, it's really no different than on Thursday morning when you're sitting around your tree or whatever whatever your family does and someone hands you a package. What do you do? You open it. Right? You open it. Listen, when Jesus comes and He is coming, He's not going to say to us, did you go to church on Sunday mornings? That won't be the question that He asks. He's not going to say, did you go to Sunday school for 30 years? That won't be the question that He asks. He will say, did you receive Me? Did you receive Me and did you know Me? Eternal life is this, Jesus said, that they may know You the Father and Jesus Christ whom You sent. Eternal life is knowing Him. Knowing Him. How do you know Him? You unwrap the package and you get to know Him. 